right. Fantastic. To everyone who's just now joining us, um, welcome to the uh, third webinar in the digital, um, in the uh, webinar series for the RRI at Massachusetts General Hospital. Um, we're just running a quick couple of polls before we get started to get a sense of who is in attendance today. Um, fantastic. So I'm going to end the first poll and send out a second one. All right, so going ahead and launch a second poll. So feel free to uh, fill that out as well, um, just as we wait for a couple more people to trickle in. Great, fantastic. Uh, welcome everybody who are just um, just joining us. Um, before we begin, we're just getting a sense of who is in attendance today uh, with a quick poll. Um, so feel free to fill those out and we will get started with the presentation shortly. All right, fantastic. All right, getting some great participation. Um, all right, I'm going to end that poll. Um, and then we have a bit of a content-based poll for um, everybody today as well that I will run just to get a sense of um, All right, so if uh, people would like to take a moment to also indicate kind of what made them come to today's webinar, that would be amazing as well. Um, once again, welcome everybody. All right, fantastic. Thank you everyone so much for submitting the polls. Um, I'm just gonna keep it open for about a minute more and then we will uh, officially begin. But welcome everybody and thank you so much for joining us today. It's amazing. All right, fantastic. Um, I am going to go ahead and end the poll. All right, fantastic. So uh, thank you everybody for joining us for the third webinar as part of our recovery science series. This is a SAMHSA funded webinar organized by the Research Recovery Institute at Massachusetts General Hospital, co-sponsored by the Opioid Response Network. My name is Maya and my co-host today is Chris. We are both staff members at the Recovery Research Institute at Massachusetts General Hospital. Um, today, 
our uh, presentation is going to be on digital recovery support services presented by Dr. Brandon Bergman. Dr. Brandon Bergman, PhD, is an, assist is an assistant professor of psychology at Harvard Medical School, associate director of the Recovery Research Institute in the Center for Addiction Medicine at the Massachusetts General Hospital, and a licensed clinical psychologist. His original research, funded in part by a career development award from the NIAAA, spans community-based addiction recovery support services, social technology, and the life stage of emerging adulthood. He completed his PhD in clinical psychology at Nova Southeastern University and his psychology internship in addiction psychology postdoctoral fellowship at the Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Medical School. So without further ado, it is uh, my honor and privilege um, to turn it over to Dr. Brandon Bergman. So I will stop sharing my screen here. And Thanks, Maya. Okay, let me share my screen then. <clears throat> Second, here we go. Can you see the, um, the slide here? Okay, Maya? Yes, all set. Okay, and you can hear me okay? Mm -hmm. All right, hold on one second. Let me also, oh, I'm already sharing my sound. Okay, good. Go. All right, perfect. Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, as Thank you, Maya, for the introduction. Um, I am Brandon Bergman. Um, so let's uh, let's let's dig in here and get get settled in for what I hope will be a, a fun um, and uh, interesting at least it will be for me a fun and interesting uh, hour or I guess you know another fifty minutes or so. So um, we are going to talk about digital recovery support services, but uh, first, just a brief um, introduction to um, what the Opioid Response Network does. Um, so here's a little bit about uh, the organization and what they do. Um, and rather than read from the slide, I'm going to uh, play you this little one minute and 50 second video um, that gives an overview of what the Opioid Response Network does and how they help folks um, like us. Communities across the nation. Can you hear that? Maya? Yeah, okay. Are mobilizing to address opioid and stimulant use and the overdose crisis. You can't overcome this alone, but we can, together, and we are. We are the Opioid Response Network, a coalition of 40 national organizations representing more than 2 million people. We serve all 50 states and nine territories locally through our network of nearly 1,000 professionals working across prevention, treatment, and recovery. For state agencies, organizations big and small, and individuals working to address local needs. We bring training and education to bear on your efforts. We're here to help you help others through evidence-based support, all at no cost to you. For instance, the Opioid Response Network helped the Tribal College in New Mexico join forces with local organizations to develop a culturally appropriate prevention, treatment, and recovery training series for its students. In Rhode Island, we convened correction staff from 34 states to share how our program had reduced post-incarceration overdose deaths by more than 60% and supported them in their efforts to build similar programs in their home states. In West Virginia, we mobilized to help a clinic incorporate substance use disorder services into their practice, serving a faith-based community. We helped healthcare providers in South Dakota address barriers they face providing treatment services for their patients. We're here to help those on the front lines. So what are your needs and how can we help? Visit the opioidresponsenetwork.org to learn more and to submit a request for support. The Opioid Response Network, funded by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. And here's just a, a little bit more about how to contact the Opioid Response Network for those who are interested. And finally, just a little note about uh, what the, the, ver the variety of things we do at the Recovery Research Institute. Um, we are made up of um, 
research faculty who uh, conduct our own original research. And we also have a, an expansive public health uh, initiative uh, that where we, um, we take the science on treatment and recovery from substance disorder and we uh, summarize, synthesize, translate and disseminate uh, it to, to, the, to the general public in, in, in a variety of ways. And one of the ways we do that is through our free uh, monthly uh, recovery research bulletin where we take um, uh, usually eight articles uh, of the, the, the latest um, scientific articles and we create summaries with visuals and talk about how this um, might uh, apply to, to a variety of, of stakeholder groups, uh, folks in recovery, families, uh, clinicians, policymakers, scientists, and so on and so forth. So uh, please feel free to check that out. Ah, okay, so on to the talk. So we, the, the, the objectives here are, are really fourfold. Um, and we're, we're gonna, um, um, what, I'm, what I'm hoping to do is kind of not rush through, but, 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 but run through these slides pretty briskly um, because I would like to leave time at the end for a little question and answer, some, some discussion potentially. Um, as, as you'll see, um, a lot of what, we're learning about digital recovery support services still in very, very early stages. And so uh, in some ways, I, I think it lends itself to a lot of discussion and brainstorming and thinking about what are the right questions, not just what are the answers, because we don't have that many answers. I don't have that many answers for you to share. But, but what I think we can do is really start to talk about, well, what are the right questions to be asking? And, and so that's one of the things I'm hoping to get out of this talk to myself today. Um, so I am hoping to, to leave uh, 15 minutes or more um, at the end uh, for, for questions and, and discussion. So here, here are the four uh, uh, talk objectives. And the, the, the only other kind of preliminary note here is this is sort of the trajectory, right? As I see it for what, what, what is the line of scientific inquiry that can help answer some of the questions? Again, I, I think I would like to really hear from you about what are, what are some of the questions you have about digital recovery support services. But this is, this is a line of inquiry um, where, uh, yes, ultimately we wanna understand uh, scientifically, well, what are the effects of participating in digital recovery support services? Um, who, who uh, like examining this, any observed benefit examining how, how is this happening? What are the mechanisms of behavior change here? And, and for whom, what are the moderators? Um, so are there different subgroups of people that are benefiting more or less? Maybe there are certain subgroups for whom these recovery support services aren't uh, potentially helpful, but maybe there are some subgroups for whom it's especially helpful, right? These are important questions. And then ultimately dissemination uh, implementation research, right? So scaling these services if we do find that they're helpful. But today, the, 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 the piece that I'm really gonna focus on are, are these first three, right? We're gonna identify some of the theory around why uh, a digital recovery support service can be helpful, why people participate. We're gonna describe some of the services, particularly services that connect peers to peers and are freely accessible, um, right? So these are services, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, but these are services that an individual who's using drugs and or inner seeking recovery can just go online right now participate in these services without any gatekeepers or without people giving them access, right? Just free, sort of free access of peer-to-peer uh, -peer digital recovery support services. And then uh, we are gonna do a little bit of characterizing participation because we do, that, that is something we do know about empirically. <clears throat> so if in-person services could do everything we needed them to do in many ways, digital recovery support services would not be so as critically needed as, as I think they are. And I think many of us uh, think they are. I'm probably, if you're here at this talk, uh, I'm, I'm likely preaching to the converted in, in some ways. Although maybe you're here because uh, you, you don't think they work and, and, and you're kind of skeptical, which is obviously fine as well. Um, so when we talk about the public health impact of a service, we, we, we have to understand, yes, is it effective, but also what's its reach? And, and we know that only one in 10 individuals with substance use disorder in, in the past year receive any kind of substance use disorder service. We're talking here about specialty treatment, but also community-based services, going to see one's uh, private physician um, where, where somebody could be talking about medication and so on and so forth. And we, uh, as, a, as a society, we, we talk about barriers that are certainly present, right? Um, uh, sort of um, insufficient healthcare coverage or no healthcare coverage or not being able to afford the cost of treatment. Um, at the, the abstinence-based nature of a lot of, of the sort of treatment paradigm, at least, at least in the U.S., being um, a, a barrier, um, not knowing where to go for treatment. But here's the interesting piece. These uh, reasons 
only apply, right, to those that did that felt they needed treatment but didn't seek it. And here are all the reasons why. The vast majority, we're talking 96% of people who don't who had a substance use disorder, right? But didn't feel but didn't see treatment, didn't feel they needed treatment. Now, I, I would submit to you. Part of that is because of how we think about treatment, right? Again, at least in the U.S. Here, I'm, I'm, I, I don't want to speak for, for treatment in, you know, internationally. I'm really talking about treatment in the United States for the, for the most part, right? And, and so for me, if we could think about shifting the paradigm also of how people access services, I suspect we could really move the needle on this idea of feeling that people not feeling they need treatment because of the, the sort of the commitment, the intensity with which we often think about substance disorder treatment in the U.S. Um, it doesn't have to be that way, though. And I think digital recovery support services is one way to be able to address um, a series of barriers um, that um, are introduced by the structure and nature of in-person of in services in, in, here in the U.S., and so we have logistical barriers, right, that, that I think the digital recovery support services can help address, right? Some people live quite a distance from, um, from services. Um, and maybe in rural areas, this person looks, looks like she's probably on a camping trip or something like that. Um, but uh, I was thinking about this picture as representing being a distance, being a ways away from in-person services. We have people with just day-to-day -day responsibilities that make it hard to access in-person services. Uh, people with... Um, where, where their job or childcare responsibilities or some combination therein. Um, and certainly COVID has um, upped the ante there. Uh, I'll talk about that in a second. A and then there are uh, just a, a host of disabilities that might make it hard for people to access in-person services, um, both physical um, and mental health disabilities. And I just want to very briefly touch on it because it's outside the scope of the talk. I, I don't mean to suggest that like digital recovery support services is like the solution to these like incredibly uh, sort of longstanding systemic ba uh, uh, barriers that by and large really need lots of policy change to, 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 to help people that are the most marginalized and vulnerable among us uh, to be able to access services. But, but you know, here we're gonna really focus on the ways that, that digital access or online access uh, to services can help address some of those logistical barriers. And then there are psychosocial barriers too. Um, so we know stigma, for example, perceived stigma is related to lower rates of treatment seeking. Uh, and this conceptually is very much related to social isolation, which can be a, just a major barrier to people seeking care. Um, there are attitudinal barriers. Um, so uh, we, we know, for example, that simply because somebody's not um, accessing care doesn't mean they don't want to make a change or aren't thinking about making a change. And so the, the convenience and 24 seven access of digital services in many ways can, I, I, I think, Help, um, help cater to folks that are more in uh, kind of contemplation, or maybe even pre-contemplation stages where they wouldn't uh, go seek out in some in-person treatment uh, or recovery support service. They might be willing to access services online. And finally, they're just a host of lifestyle um, factors that uh, reinforce uh, people's substance use, things they get in terms of their life and their, and their self-esteem and their self-worth and their sense of belonging that they get from using substances that, that could be very hard to address. And so they might not be willing to, to seek out treatment as we think about it in the, in, in the US, but they might be willing to explore more and learn more about ways to make changes in their substance use um, online. <clears throat> And, and, and so when we think about um, digital technology and, and why I think they might be um, helpful ways to address some of these in-person service barriers, the most important reason is they're just immersed in our day-to-day -day lives. And, and I think there are certainly side effects to this. And we'll, that, that's at the very end of this talk, uh, I do wanna talk about potentially some of the downsides or some of the, 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 the side effects or the risks that might come along with participating in digital recovery support services. So I don't wanna, I, I don't want my kind of, thesis here to be like, oh yeah, digital recovery support services are some panacea that are going to solve all of our <clears throat> problems with access to care. They're not. But we do know that 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 that, that we are immersed and digital technologies are, are especially online digital technologies are very much part of our day-to-day -day lives. Um, and this is true for folks across different age groups. Um, even in folks who are 65 and over, you see this upward trajectory um, if you look at it by age group as well. One thing I want to point out here is um, this uh, home broadband, access to home broadband, um, which it, it, especially for, for things that require um, video access, uh, um, uh, like online recovery meetings, other kinds of things, 
uh, where a speedy internet connection makes a difference. I, I, I will come back to that in terms of some of the downsides, because as we know, there's a digital divide and, and this home broadband access really does divide along um, socioeconomic lines. And this technology access or immersion of technology does appear to be true also for folks uh, in substance disorder treatment. Uh, there's just a couple of studies here demonstrating that. And then one quick note too about COVID-19, because um, the digital services and, and online services and telehealth um, have really, there's really been a mainstreaming of them um, because of COVID, right? Um, and, and there's been a, 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 lim a, a limiting to the ways that people can access in-person services. But again, I, what I would submit here is that COVID has highlighted and exacerbated, it didn't create um, these uh, uh, problems or barriers to accessing uh, services. They might have created a sort of higher stress level and, and uh, um, maybe added weight to, 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 to this need of, in terms of physical, like sort of public health, physical distancing uh, guidelines, and in terms of the isolation um, that we're seeing and a reduced social uh, connection. But these are just long standing problems for folks who use drugs and are in their seeking recovery. Um, and, and so I would say that as awful as COVID-19 has been and, and just the, the public health harms and, and, the, and the harms to individuals and families that it's caused, I, there's a silver lining here in terms of the, the increased comfort uh, with which we really all now have, or most of us now have with digital healthcare access. It's brought this to the fore. And, and, and there's, we again are gonna talk about digital um, innovations and in ways that digital services um, can, <clears throat> can address some of these in-person barriers, but innovation is not, I just wanna just, I'm just gonna point it out here for the, at this one at this one time, cause it's, I'm not gonna cover too much um, at, at too many other points throughout the talk. Innovation is not simply um, 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 the purview of kind of technology based services or interventions. Innovat innovation can take many different forms, right? Um, and, and there's lots of different ways that we as a, as a field have had to innovate. Um, but again, access to services is not a new issue, right? Uh, and so I think there's a silver lining here where it's, there's a, a sort of reduced access for everybody, not just the most marginalized. So what are digital recovery support services? Let's, let's define them before we kind of talk about what we know um, about them uh, empirically and, and some theory about why they might be helpful. So just, just let's, let's revisit really briefly from, from John Kelly's talk back in April, what are recovery support services? Um, and I have a table coming up on the next slide to talk about how recovery support services are different from treatment. But th these are kind of six domains of uh, recovery support services. Um, and they run the gamut. You know, some of them don't involve necessarily um, help. Uh, you know, helping professionals in R. Some of them are, are uh, rely on peer-to-peer -peer connections, like mutual help organizations. Some of them um, uh, rely on folks with lived experience, but who have specialized training and often are, are, are credentialed, right? Like peer recovery support specialists and so on and so forth. Recovery community centers. Uh, as well, which can uh, really help folks uh, enhance their recovery capital. And so what's the difference though between these services and treatment? So they differ in their goal, their kind of primary goal. And here I'm talking across the board, you're gonna have exceptions to this rule in general, right? But for the most part, treatment or clinical interventions are intended to reduce symptoms and substance use, whereas recovery support services are intended to enhance recovery. Um, that involves both helping people or the process, right? The process of resolving substance use problems or effort or the experience of, right? It's not necessarily that people resolve them or not, but the process or the experience of, and then fostering, cultivating health uh, um, and well-being and all the variety of, of life domains that that entails, um, employment, uh, education, knowing how to um, sort of navigate the, the healthcare system, um, social support and so on and so forth. Right. Whereas clinical interventions uh, tend to be time limited and structured, recovery support services can be accessed over the long term. And I, I think for me, the, the primary um, differentiator here is that uh, we think of recovery support services as operating within the community and treatment uh, as operating within healthcare settings. Again, there are exceptions, right? Because we know that um, uh, um, peer recovery support specialists, sometimes called recovery coaching, they're operating healthcare settings now across the country at Mass General Hospital. We have just an amazing uh, group of, of recovery coaches um, that operate within Mass General Hospital and all its different 
um, uh, kind of community uh, uh, programs, but, but the services themselves are operating in the community. They're meeting people where they're at, helping people navigate a variety of things. Um, so the, the, even though the, 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 they are kind of housed or, or, or um, um, uh, initiate um, at, in healthcare settings, they're still operating in the community, right? And then um, the other piece is uh, recovery support services often involve peers and or folks with lived experience who are credentialed, whereas treatment is, is designed and or delivered by professionals. Again, there are some exceptions, but these are some general ideas. And so so then what are the digital recovery support services? Well, it's the use of digital technology, right? Um, in lieu of or as an adjunct to these in-person recovery support services. Um, and, and so here you'll see some differences between technology-based intervention, um, which has is, is analogous in my mind to uh, clinical interventions uh, or treatment versus digital recovery support services. Um, again, there are some exceptions, but, but, but these are the main differences. Uh, just a couple of uh, other um, kinds of uh, terminological notes here before we um, get to describing these services. I think this is important. Um, I think the, the first thing is that we're not really gonna be talking about telehealth, right? And none of this is to say that what the, these, the, these other ways of, of using technology to help folks with substance, you know, who are using drugs uh, or who are sort of interseeking recovery, um, it's not to say that these other things aren't important. That, that's just not what, what I focus on what we're gonna be talking about too much. So there's telehealth, right? And so the, 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 the prefix tele just means from a di over a distance. And so telehealth is the delivery of healthcare uh, over distance. And uh, telehealth can actually be delivered via phone. It doesn't have to be uh, digital telehealth, but oftentimes we do, it does involve the use of, of digital or online technology to deliver it, right? There's telehealth versus technology-based intervention, which is the adaptation of clinical interventions using technology. Um, so as an example there, um, a technology-based intervention um, uh, that is empirically supported and has, has lots of data that supports efficacy is, is the therapeutic education system. The therapeutic education system is a technology-based adaptation of the community reinforcement approach, which is an empirically supported uh, uh, psychosocial treatment, right? And, and for those who, who are stay up to date with, with the news in this space, RESET is an FDA-approved digital therapeutic, which is based on the therapeutic education system, right? So these are technology-based interventions where they're ostensibly clinical interventions that have been adapted um, with the use of technology to increase access. We're not really gonna be talking about them today, but again, those are important. The, the other piece here is when people say like, oh, it's a, it's a smartphone app for recovery. I would submit, and we'll talk about why, that to say it's a smartphone app, does it really have any inherent meaning in terms of what service is being offered or how it's intended to help people? Because a smartphone application, right, meaning it's, 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 a, it's a piece of software that we access with a smartphone, either an iPhone or an Android device or, or whatever. It, there are smartphone apps that help people monitor their substance use or provide psychoeducation about the nature of substance use or recovery. Um, or it, 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 they can also be ways to connect peers to peers or to access um, a technology-based intervention. So I'll talk about how we um, navigate these sort of terminology, these, these uh, kind of muddy areas of terminology. And, and, and finally, I just want to talk about this term telerecovery. My colleague, Robert Ashford, is um, starting to use this, and I, I quite like it where we think about, again, this prefix of tele, meaning over a distance, and it's telerecovery, meaning a recovery support services that are provided over a distance, which oftentimes we think about like recovery coaching and meeting people where they're at and, 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 and helping uh, create access for people that might not otherwise have it. Um, we, we really need to be creative and, 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 and there's a host of ways in which that can be done. And so use the use of, of digital technology, in addition to telephone, um, uh, to, to be clear, can be helpful. Now, Digital recovery support service is one type, um, or telerecovery is one type of digital recovery support service. So I think there's some overlap here. We're really going to be talking about the ways in which digital recovery support services, digital recovery support services that are freely available online can, can be accessed 24/7, but that are not necessarily where somebody doesn't necessarily have to have a credential or some sort of professional training in order to provide it. But again, those are there, there are digital recovery support services. Um, that fall into that domain. That's just not the, the sort of purview of, of, of this talk here. 
And, and so finally, um, I, I, there's a, a paper that, that we wrote and uh, all this stuff, um, if I, I give my, um, my email address at the very end, please feel free to email me. Um, you'll, you'll have access to this, this, all the slides and, um, and, a, and a, an archive video. This talk will be a, a available on the RI website. But in addition, um, the slides will include my email address. Please feel free to reach out if you have any questions about anything I'm talking about or any of the papers that I end up mentioning, if you want copies of them. Um, uh, as, as, as a colleague who's interested in the search, I'm happy to send that um, to you all. So the, the, I go, we, we go into this, um, this classification system in more detail in, in, a, in a paper that was published in the Journal of Substance Abuse Treatment. So how should we be talking about digital recovery support services, right? Because as I said, to say, oh, this is a, it's, a, it's an app that does this, or it's a website that does that, um, that doesn't necessarily describe what the service entails. And as folks uh, who are um, working with, with uh, uh, patients or recovery support service participants and peers and um, to, be, to be able to access these services, it's important that we have the, um, the, 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 the sort of um, overarching understanding of what we're, what we're recommending that they do uh, before we send them over there. And so the first thing is thinking about, well, what kind of service is being offered here, right? Um, what's the service? What's the activity, right? Is it, a me is it a meeting where they're connecting with other people? Is it a, a, a recovery support meeting, 12 step? Uh, is it a smart meeting? Is it an, uh, um, um, an all recovery meeting, right? Um, uh, different kinds of meetings. Um, or is it, a, is it a discussion forum? Um, is it a, a, a sort of social network site? Um, where people are posting things and engaging with streams of user shared and user generated content and so on and so forth. Um, is, is it happening in real time? It, meaning is it synchronous or is it asynchronous um, where people can post something and then go access it later where there are no time constraints, right? Then, so that's one thing, right? What kind of service is it? Then, well, what kind of platform is it? So is it a social network site where people are connecting with other people? Is it a discussion forum? Are they using some remote video conferencing platform like we're using now, like Zoom, right? So what's the actual technology uh, or the platform that's being used here? Then the third thing is how, how can it be accessed? Is it a website? Is it a smartphone application? Some of these platforms can only be accessed via smartphone. But that's important. They don't have um, associated websites that provide uh, the same service, right? It can only be accessed via smartphone or only be accessed via website. And again here, some of them, like if we think about online recovery support meetings, um, I know I, when we think about physical disability, for example, um, it might be important for somebody who is vision impaired for that service to be able to be accessed uh, via telephone or with some, at least some audio capability that doesn't rely completely on video, right? So points of access. And then finally, what organization is responsible for designing, developing, monitoring, and overseeing um, the service? Um, sometimes it's a mutual help organization itself. Sometimes it's a private company. Sometimes they're peer volunteers. This, this, is, this is important uh, in terms of being able to provide recommendations to patients. And so, as I said, there are lots of different ways that technology can be used um, uh, to, to help folks with substance use disorder. We're really going to be focusing today on the ways in which technology connects peers to peers. <clears throat> so let's very briefly here talk about well, what do we know empirically um, about uh, uh, sort of how, how much people are using or, or the prevalence with which people are using um, online or, or digital recovery support services. Um, and then uh, the kinds of factors, the kinds of folks that, are, that have a greater propensity to use these services. So this comes from a study we conducted, this was pre-COVID, this was um, back in 2018, I think. Um, this, these, these, these data come from the National Recovery Study. So this is, um, this is a nationally representative sample of individuals who uh, self-reporting have self-reported having resolved uh, an alcohol or other drug problem, and of those people, 11%, about one out of 10, um, said uh, that they, that they used some sort right of online technology uh, to help them in their recovery, and that translated when we think about the national representation of the sample 
um, sort of 22.35 million U.S. adults who uh, resolve uh, an alcohol other drug problem, about 10% of those, we're talking 2.2, roughly 2.2 million people who, this is pre-COVID, I suspect that number is actually higher, had used some sort of online service um, that we asked about to, to help um, either reduce substance use, uh, quit substance use, or to strengthen the recovery. That's how we asked the question. And this was the breakdown of um, the different ways in which people were using technology. Obviously, these options were not mutually exclusive, right, because they are, are way more than 100%. And so this is an online mutual help organization, right? So like um, AA accessed via Zoom or something like that um, versus the use of general interest social network sites. So this is like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, now TikTok. I have a colleague, Alex Russell, who, who looks at how people are using uh, who's looking at how people are using TikTok to aid uh, in their recovery um, or how recovery is being depicted on TikTok, which is very cool. Um, and then also the use of recovery specific social network sites. So these are sites, and I'm gonna talk about this a little bit in a little bit more detail because this is the, my own particular area of interest in, in research. These are social network sites that are dedicated specifically to recovery, to people in seeking or curious about recovery, right? And then these other services. So we didn't get into this too much, but this is this is these smartphone applications that I talked about a little bit before. Uh, so I just want to focus over here on the right hand side um, with the kinds of factors when we control for the range of factors that are associated with or correlated with the use of online. Um, technology to aid recovery. What, what are the unique factors when you control for all of them? Yeah, I want to just really point out this one because it, it was not a, an effect that I expected, where people with a household income uh, of $30,000 a year or less versus those with a, a household income of $100,000 a year or more were actually more likely um, to use online services. And then we also see uh, some other things we're just sort of service utilization in general is a predictor of other on, of online services and, and recent psychological distress. So generally, the way that I think about this is there's a, you know, people with uh, more severe uh, substance use uh, are, 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 have a, a sort of greater propensity, as you might imagine, they, they're, they're more likely to use lots of different things to aid in the recovery. And while there's more research needed here to really understand this effect, one uh, hypothesis that I have, a post hoc hypothesis, I didn't have this, hy this hypothesis going into the study, is that folks who have lower incomes they have to be more creative. And so one of those ways that they're more creative is by accessing digital services. Again, it's to say nothing of the fact that just the need for kind of you know, more systemic support for, for these folks. And so how might digital services make a difference? Um, so this is, all, again, this is theory, and this is, uh, again, again come from this, this publication, where we think about, well, what are peer-based digital services, and how can they be helpful to people? Well, I, I, I think about the ways in which um, people might come in and be looking, uh, and if we think about all the, the different um, social factors in Yalom's uh, group therapy, uh, factors of group, sort of curative factors in group therapy and how can people help other people? Um, so there's this, we, we know from, from research and qualitative research that um, when we ask people like, you know, how do you derive my benefits and um, from, from 12 step groups in particular, and this does seem to apply to digital recovery support services as well, and I'll get into that. This idea of a shared experience, a, a universal experience and not feeling so alone, that comes up a lot. And, and an installation of hope, this idea of seeing other people, hearing what other people are doing, um, instilling hope, oh, I can do it, I, it, 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 it looking at so-and-so that they could do it, right? So that would lead to more participation. And then think, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that um, sort of traditional mechanisms of behavior change, where, again, seeing other people um, in recovery, doing well, would enhance positive recovery expectancies. Um, it provides act, they can provide access to recovery coping skills, accessing social support, for example, getting new ideas uh, about how to cope with cravings, enhance recovery, face challenges. That would, would also be related to enhanced self-efficacy or confidence to handle risky situations. Some supportive network changes, again, related to social support. And that in turn would, would relate to um, enhanced outcomes, uh, including both substance use and other um, uh, recovery outcomes uh, like uh, enhanced health and well-being. So now I'm just going to talk really briefly about um, some different services. Um, so one is online recovery support meetings. Uh, and so primarily, I, I, I think that the, 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 the ways in which um, 
social identity and social norms can be powerful in terms of the substance use. So one of the things we know is that social norms is a, is a very powerful mechanism in terms of increasing substance use where, where college students often calibrate their substance use to match the norms or the descriptive norms of their peers. Um, we haven't looked at this empirically yet, but I, I'm very curious about whether these uh, digital recovery support services can offer a social norm uh, of recovery, right? And through kind of social contagion um, and, and, and via social identity theories of health behavior change might be able uh, to promote recovery in that way. And again, you just think about some of these mechanisms of behavior change that we know empirically people derive from um, in-person um, uh, recovery support meetings, mainly 12-step 12, 12 meetings like Alcoholics Anonymous. There's no reason to suspect that, that they can't also be um, derived from online meetings. <clears throat> But empirically, as I said before, we don't know too much um, uh, about uh, the effects of online recovery support meetings, at least, at least not yet. Online recovery communities. So I talked about this a little bit, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip this slide, but really we think about communities in general, um, and I'm gonna talk about what some different kinds of online communities, it's these sorts of potential um, mechanisms or ways that people could benefit from online communities that I'm particularly interested in. And, and, and I am gonna describe one uh, study uh, that shows that there is some now um, empirical support um, for the, the presence of these different factors in online communities that gives us some um, clue that, that, there is, uh, that there are therapeutic things taking place uh, in, in, online, in online communities, right? <clears throat> and again, I think to come back to this idea of stigma, because there, there is an anonymity that is built into online recovery communities where people do not have to announce themselves or show themselves if they don't want to, right? So it's a way to access these mechanisms while also being anonymous, circumventing potentially the stigma-related barrier. And as I mentioned before, also it gives, it gives people who might be more contemplative a chance to kind of dip their toe in the water, so to speak, um, if they might not uh, otherwise be willing to go seek out in-person services or other kinds of services that require major commitment. So here are just some definitions. I, I just wanna move through this because I'm, I'm noticing the time and I do wanna leave time for, for, for some questions and answers. Um, but for me, online recovery communities, uh, it's an online space dedicated to recovery. It can be an actual online space, but work can be conceptual where, for example, people on a, a general uh, interest site like uh, Twitter, TikTok, or Instagram, they might use a hashtag, a recovery related hashtag uh, to, to become part of this community that's not an actual sort of standalone or uh, what Robert Ashford calls a closed ecosystem. It might be part of this open ecosystem, but where people use digital strategies like hashtags to create this online recovery community. Then you also have these recovery specific social network sites, which are a type of online community, a special type that look like social network sites like Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, but are dedicated to helping folks in recovery. And then there are online recovery forums, which are, which are more like discussion boards. All these things overlap, but I just wanna kind of give some terminology distinctions here. So these are online recovery forums. And well, what do we know about them empirically? Uh, Patty Cavazos Reg and, and some of her colleagues uh, have done some really cool work on online recovery forums, doing content analyses, particularly on um, Reddit based recovery, Reddit based groups on, uh, uh, that are dedicated to recovery from different substances. And so, as I was talking about before, these um, curative therapeutic factors um, theorized by um, Irvin Yalom, they, th these folks did a content analysis and showed that looking at the 100 hottest posts, don't have time to get into the algorithm used to determine the 100 hottest posts, but they looked at all the comments on them. There are 500 plus. And they looked at whether they mapped onto these curative factors. Uh, and you do see uh, uh, that, that they, especially imparting information, installation of hope, universality, and altruism, where, where people are sort of doing good. And the most important piece for me is that while we're learning more empirically, they looked at the content where information was being disseminated, sort of advice, and a very, very negligible amount was potentially harmful, which I think is important. Um, here are just some other findings. We know that this is the same group. Uh, groups dedicated to substance use may contain some important harm reduction advice, which I, I think is, is key. And then 
uh, and a study of She Recovers, which is an online community dedicated to, to female identify individuals, four out of five had already or wanted to connect with folks in person. So I think that speaks for me to the overlap potentially between digital services and in-person services, where they're not, it's not necessarily about one or the other. There's likely to be interrelationships between them where folks who might use digital services, they might use that as a conduit to in-person services and so on and so forth. Then there's recovery specific social network sites. What do we know about these empirically? Again, I just wanna work through these uh, real quick. So this con th these data come from a study um, that we did as a cross-sectional survey of folks who use one particular recovery social network site called intherooms.com. Um, and what do, we, what do we learn about? What do we learn about them? This is not necessarily representative of the entire recovery social network site. Uh, but I do want to point out is a, a sample that was primarily white, so it might not it's not might not be it's not representative of folks with substance disorder. It's just the just the sample that we got. Um, it is lot, lot, folks with seven plus years on average of abstinence. Although about thirty three percent, a third of them were not abstinent or had less than a year. These are the kinds of uh, services they were using, as I mentioned before. Um, the, the platforms that we're talking about, in this case, a recovery specific social network site, that's the platform. There are many different types of digital of, of recovery support services that are offered on this platform. And these are the kinds of services that people were using. There's daily meditation, the, the video meetings, these are on, live online video meetings, these discussion boards or these recovery forums that I was talking about before. So this is the, the nature of them. And this just means that Folks who had less than a year uh, of abstinence or a year plus, they had uh, ostensibly similar rates of participation in these services. Oh, what are the downsides? Um, and then I have one more set of slides after this, and then, and then um, we can sort of shift gears to question and answer. So I think this is important where, yes, kind of thinking theoretically uh, and empirically about what we know to be helpful about these services, but what are the potential downsides? Um, so he, he, here are some of the, um, we, we asked, we also asked them qualitatively to, to talk about, uh, I think we worded it like, so what are your top three reasons or the top three things you find most helpful about in the rooms.com. And, and th these were, we did uh, some qualitative analyses. Um, th these were some of the, the reasons uh, why or the things they found most helpful. I, I thought, right, so this is a part of what, what the in the rooms offers. To, to me, this is, I'm talking about this sort of access to, to treatment that, that or to the access to digital services that might not otherwise be possible um, without digital services, right? Um, now here are some of the downsides, right? Some of the functional or technical issues. This was, this was conducted back in 2017. Uh, I suspect this stuff is still, still applicable now. Um, some of the, the downsides to online socialization in general and where anonymity might be a benefit to some to engaging where they, they don't wanna have to announce themselves and they can circumvent some of that stigma. We, those of, those of you guys who, who spend any time in online social spaces, you, you know that there's some snark that goes on and they could be toxic environments sometimes too, right? And so it's not, um, again, it's not all therapeutic in nature. <clears throat> um, and here's a little bit about some of the other recovery support services uh, or the other, sorry, um, uh, recovery specific social network sites. Uh, this is a study by Robert Ashford and colleagues and another recovery uh, specific social network site called uh, sober grid. Um, and then there, I want to just briefly mention another recovery specific social network site because they, they, this group is from Australia and they've done, they've actually followed folks uh, longitudinally over time. Um, and it, it, while Australian citizens do have free access, there's a fee. So I, that's sort of, sort of outside the scope of this talk, but where uh, people that are more engaged do seem to demonstrate improved drinking outcomes um, longitudinally. Finally, um, want to just reemphasize or reiterate some of these potential drawbacks um, and then uh, go over some um, sort of referral strategies, things to keep in mind. And then um, that'll be the end of the slide deck here. So one of the things we know about um, from research is, especially from the mutual help literature, is yes, uh, that, the, that attendance at mutual help groups, again, we know quite a bit more about 12-step groups like Alcoholics Anonymous, um, but attendance and randomized controlled trials where folks are randomized to 12-step facilitation uh, and that, that shows benefit for 12-step facilitation. Those um, uh, treatments um, confer benefit through attendance, right? So attendance is helpful, but 
active involvement seems to seems to really carry a lot of the weight with where people who are um, socializing with other members outside of groups really changing up their social uh, networks getting a sponsor in, in 12 step groups for example and so whether at people can really access that active involvement in the same way that they can in person that's an important period of question uh, there, there are pieces of digital services that I think are important, right? Nonverbal cues might be hard to pick up. I, 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 there's some data that suggests that there's increased physiological arousal um, related to uh, video uh, or telecommunication um, that, that, that in, in many ways might require more cognitive resources and increase anxiety. That could introduce a barrier in some ways to, to, to social connection and requiring more resource, more kind of cognitive and emotional resources to access. These are just important questions to be thinking about. Data privacy, not gonna get into that only because it's just an area that, that requires way more than, a, than, than 30 seconds, but that's important. And this digital divide that I mentioned, we're just gonna wanna take a look at home broadband here. and. About, I, th I think when you look at overall, I think it's three out of four people in the US have access to home broadband, but that divides along socioeconomic lines where you see the dark blue is people who have a household income of less than $30,000 a year. Um, they, they're the least likely to have access to home broadband, which, which cuts across that, that finding I mentioned before um, about folks with less than $30,000 a year being more likely to access online services. So that's a conversation for another day, but that is important to point out. And then finally, just some caution in terms of these general general interest spaces um, on Facebook, for example, there is a, a, an interesting investigative uh, piece showing that that patient brokers um, were creating Facebook groups that were ostensibly about helping people. Uh, but but when um, this investigative journalist Kat Ferguson dug deeper, there was some kind of nefarious motives there. And so that's important also for us to keep in mind um, is where we're referring folks and, and, and knowing as much about these services as, as we can. And, and so in terms of tips for referral, I already talked about knowing as much as we can about the digital service, um, discussing ways to enhance privacy given some of those downsides making sure, you know, uh, you know, encouraging folks to use a username uh, or a pseudonym in, except, in, instead of their own username, making sure that they're in a safe physical space so that uh, anything about their own personal privacy is not being revealed if they don't want it to, and checking in regularly with them. Um, we're not, not just asking them about ways that they might be benefiting, thinking about these therapeutic mechanisms of behavior change. Are they feeling a sense of social support from these digital recovery support services? Is it increasing their confidence um, to handle risky situations? Are you noticing with them any, any shifts in, in, in their stage of, of change and, and readiness to, to make changes uh, in their substance use? And then finally assessing for any of these risks or potential side effects uh, that, that we were talking about. Uh, here are some readings from our group. Um, and some some other resources. This is a great if you're interested in learning about smart some of these smartphone applications, which I, I, which is really outside the scope of our talk. This is a great resource here as well. Um, it gets into all the different smartphone applications, um, who oversees them, what kinds of services they offer, and so on and so forth. So with that, I will stop. Um, here's my email and uh, Twitter handle in case you're interested in this research like I am. I, I tweet about this um, when I can, and um, that's that. Uh, we can. We, I didn't leave as much time as I thought for questions, but let's let's stop there and, and give folks about five minutes to ask questions and, and for discussion. Maya, do we have any questions? Uh, no questions in the chat, but. Okay. Uh, People can feel free to either unmute and ask questions or drop them in the chat uh, if, if anyone has any questions. Sure. I'll, I'll give folks 30 seconds and, and, and if not, we can I can dive back into um, and I, I had to really um, go through the kind of downsides quickly so I can take a moment to, to spend a little more time on that. No questions? Okay. Let me then. Hold on one second. Where is. Uh, 
Um, ah, okay, yes. So in the last four minutes, one thing I, I really didn't get to talk about was, and, and this is again, something to assess with patients or participants that you, that you work with. We, we, one, of the, one of the reasons or, or, or sort of um, factors in thinking about um, the potential benefits of digital recovery support services for me is that we have data that show that if you take the, this, the same treatment and deliver it um, in person or deliver it via telehealth, uh, you see similar benefit. This is for, for, for treatments that um, are intended to help folks with alcohol use disorder or for treatments that are intended to help folks with opioid, uh, uh, opioid use disorder along with uh, medications like buprenorphine, right? And so you, we do see similar treatment effects um, for um, in-person versus uh, telehealth um, delivered services. Uh, at the same time, um, in, in, a, in a separate uh, systematic review, you, you do see that the alliance uh, or this idea of there's a sort of a reduced uh, a feeling uh, or reduced kind of uh, uh, feeling that there's a, an alliance in the group, right, in, in, in person versus tele, telehealth. Meaning if somebody's getting group therapy via telehealth or somebody is getting group therapy in person, there do seem to be a, a, a little bit of a, of a decay in the effect of, of, of the alliance or the connection that people feel to other group members via telehealth. And so that's a little bit of a clue to me that that's something that we need to pay attention to where um, a lot of what I'm talking about, right, involves peer-to-peer -peer connection and group-based processes happening online, like online recovery support meetings, for example. So if it does rely on these same factors of, of, of social connection um, that, that are very much about the alliance, it is possible that we wouldn't necessarily see the same benefit from in-person, right, meeting attendance or in-person, um, uh, in especially in-person um, you know, 12 step meeting tense, because we know again a whole lot more about 12 step um, mutual help organization meetings. Um, that effect wouldn't necessarily translate to online recovery support meetings because that alliance online might not carry the same weight. We don't know that. That's an empirical question. I'm going to be taking a look at that myself empirically in some of the work I'm doing with online recovery support meetings. But that's just one other drawback I wanted to bring up to keep in mind. That's worth checking in with patients about if they are attending online recovery support meetings, asking them if they, if they feel a sense of connection to the other members or how they navigate this idea of connecting with other people um, in these online spaces. Because that might there might be uh, some potential, some important potential difference between in-person and digital Digital recovery support services along those lines. So it is now 1259, you know, so we're essentially out of time. Um, again, thank you uh, for your time. Uh, please do feel free to, to send me an email if you're interested in any of the papers uh, that I mentioned. I'm happy to send those along. Follow me on Twitter and uh, check out um, our website, recoveryanswers.org, for a host of information um, about the, the science of recovery, including but not uh, limited to uh, an archive of, of this talk and, and the slides. So with that, I'll, I'll end there and thanks for your time.